Hey, it's Nika's your channel. Tonight we're going to be doing a selected reading from Everything You Love Will Burn by Vegas Tenold, and we'll be reading Chapter 3, The Defender of Western Civilization. One of Matthew's earliest memories is of his mother being worried. It was an evening in 1995, and like they always did, Matthew and his parents are watching the 6 o'clock news on their old wood box TV. Matthew was sitting cross-legged on the white and brown carpet in the living room. His, Carl, his dad, Carl Heimbach, sat in his usual place in the recliner along the wall. His mother, Margaret, was walking in and out from the kitchen, obstinately checking on dinner. While she cast anxious glances at the screen, it was during the tail end of the O.J. Simpson trial, and the country was speculating not only about whether Simpson did it, but also about what would happen if he was found guilty. Two years earlier, in 1992, riots tore L.A. apart after police who were felons beating Rodney King were acquitted. These memories were fresh in everybody's mind, and as the newscaster discussed the pending Simpson verdict, the screen flashed to riots footage of truck driver Reg Reginald Denny being pulled from the truck's driver's seat of his truck and beaten mercilessly. One of the assailants pelted a mango-sized brick into the side of his head from point-blank range. The footage showed Denny slumping over onto his face as blood pooled around him. It'll be the same thing all over again if OJ goes to jail, Matthew's father said. But his mom left the living room again. She liked the news, but only if it showed happy stories, preferably something with animals. Matthew was born in 1991, the oldest of three siblings in Poolsville, a small town in Montgomery County, Maryland, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Montgomery County is a particular mix of Bucolic and the suburban where farmers and D.C. lobbyists share a tepid coexistence in the country's Confederate hi county's Confederate history of pride and clash with the liberal values of the D.C. newcomers. The family lived on a quiet, leafy street not far from the school where both his parents worked. In a tidy, mid-century house with white siding and cherry red shutters that Matthew's mother took care to paint every spring. In front of the house was a small yard with evergreen bushes that his mother tended meticulously and that each summer blossomed with hundreds of small and red flowers. His neighborhood was overwhelmingly white, and most of his friends grew up either Methodist or Baptist. Matthew's dad was a lapsed Lutheran, but because Matthew's mom was a devout Catholic, he converted to make her happy. None of the adults in his life growing up were particularly political, although his grandfather would keep the conservative pundit Sh Sean Hannity show on in the background as Matthew and his brother and sister played on the rug. His childhood, for the most part, was a happy one. Matthew's maternal grandparents lived close and took care of him and his siblings whenever Margaret wasn't around. His grandfather, Roger Shears, was head of the Isaac Walton League, a national organization that promotes outdoorsmanship and conservation. He would take Matthew and his siblings on long hikes, teaching his grandkids to shoot and recognize animals. As Matthew got older, he would spend countless hours roaming his grandparents' 40 acres of streams, hills, and woods, cataloging the things he saw and asking his parents and grandparents about it later. His mom would say she couldn't even take him for a walk down the block without him Driving into her distraction with questions about every bug and leaf he found on the street. Margaret Heimbach coached the Poolsville Indians, the women's basketball team at Poolsville High School, where Matthew's dad taught history and eventually became the athletic director. His bookshelves at home were covered with encyclopedias and history books that Matthew would leaf through. As a kid, Matthew was close with his dad and the two spent hours talking about history, and particularly the Civil War, which fascinated and terrified him in equal measure. Poosville had sided with the Confederacy during the war, and there were still those in town who took pride in their Southern heritage. Matthew sided with his dad, who was a Yankee, but because his family, his mother at least, was Catholic, Matthew was enrolled in Catholic school from first to fourth grade. And when he transferred to Poosville Elementary School, he was a smart kid and got good grades. And when he Flunked out a chorus because he couldn't carry a tune. He convinced his teachers to allow him to make up the lost credits by teaching a 30-minute history class in history every Friday. And he would spend hours preparing, taking his dad's 
notes from his high school history lessons and adapting them for our elementary school audience. He brought in clear sheets of overhead plastic on which he wrote names, dates, and battles, focusing on his two favorite wars, the Civil War and the Vietnam War, as those were also his dad's favorites. In 2001, the Montgomery County School Board decided that the Poolsville Indians was offensive and needed to be changed. The school board, along with the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs, recently voted to ban all Native American-themed names and mascots from county schools and offered Poolsville High School $80,000 to remove the Indians' logo. The profile of a stern-looking Native American brave in a feather dress all from uniform signs and buildings and replace it with something more fitting of modern times. Matthew, who had grown up with the Poozle Indians, spent endless Fridays watching his mom's team play, was offended. He wasn't alone. The town, in show of defiance, when offered to change to vote for the new name, overwhelmingly voted for the Poozle Indians. Some even painted the words, Go Indians! on the town war tower, as the local Poolsvillians were mocked in the national news as backward rednecks and racists. The board decided the team would now be known as the Falcons, and it was with Matthew had his first taste of being labeled a racist. It stuck with him. Being a precocious kid, Matthew got into politics when he started high school. As a teenager, mostly to piss off his parents, he fell into left-wing politics. Growing up, most of his friends were Baptists. As he got older, he began questioning what they believed, and some of the more outlandish dogmatism, such as crea- creation, offended his both love of history and science as he began showing up for the meetings of the high school's Christian club full of questions. He would ask them how it was possible to believe that humans once rode dinosaurs or had made any sense the earth was really 6,000 years old, and that all the evidence contrary was just red herrings placed there by God to test us. He would grown up reading the Bible and became adept at pointing out inconsistencies between the Old and New Testament and religious tenets that to him seemed bizarre or cruel. He inherited a fierce anti-abortion stance from his Catholic mother and the lack of action from Christians to stop the millions of innocent babies disgusted him. He met with priests who told him about the importance of standing up for the lives of innocents and then watched how they never put their words into action. One day, he asked a priest what reason, other than his own cowardice, was to not kill a doctor who was planning on performing abortions. Surely it was worth taking the life of one man to save many. As Matthew recalled, all he got was a reply of a lot of hemming and hawing about not killing. Matthew never planned on killing any doctors, but the complete lack of spiritual convention and convincing answers from religious leaders made them seem pathetic, weak and pathetic. If they couldn't even fight for the lives of the unborn, what good were they? To strengthen his arguments, he began reading books by atheist writers such as Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, which in turn introduced him to the leftist politics of Noam Chomsky. This was during the early days of the George W. Bush administration, and the more Matthew read, the more he thought he recognized the absurdity of the day. As he saw it, the United States was imposing its values on defenseless states, demanding that they let America play world police in exchange for Coca-Cola and whatever version of democracy the neocons in Washington, D.C. saw fit to bestow upon them. At his home, childhood version of the Christian faith was being destroyed by Jerry Fowell Jr. style evangelicals who preached that Jesus wanted to make money and be rich. As far as he could tell, there was no longer such thing as compassionate conservatism. And the hucksters who put Christianity to work and supported government imperialism were co-opting whatever goodwill toward mankind American Christians once had. The whole thing disgusted him. A friend of his had a sister at Towson University, and once a week she gave him a ride to campus to attend meetings of the Socialist Student Union where he sat in awe listening to guest speakers and the older kids discussing the dangers and profound unjust traditions of American imperialism. At one of these meetings, one of the college students gave a Matthew a CD by 1960s radical folk singer Phil Oaks, and he slipped the disc in his CD and heard Oaks sing about America being the cops of the world. But Matthew's world was forever changed. From then on, he devoured any piece of political folk 
music he could get his hands on. It wasn't so much the peacenik sentiment of the songs that grabbed him, but rather the fundamental unfairness of the United States imposing its will on other people. Once after a concert at Towson, Matthew cornered the anarchist folk singer David Rokvix and told him how important his music was to him and that had given him a sense of purpose. Rovix smiled and told him to never give up. Matthew was impressed that a star like Rovix had taken the time to talk to a nobody like him and he actually came away inspired. In high school, Matthew fell in with the theater crowd and started building sets and decorations for school plays. He never tried his hand at acting but did discover that he was good at building things and he also liked the people he met through theater. Most of them were left-leaning like him, and many of the girls were impressed by the fact that he regularly hung out with the college kids at Towson, and he seemed to know his way around an argument. Around the same time, Matthew and his grandmother, mostly for fun, got into genealogy. Matthew discovered that one of his ancestors, Joseph R. James from North Carolina, had fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War. He was still exceeding fond of history, even then picturing himself following in his dad's footsteps and becoming a history teacher, and the revelation that his own blood had fought in the war prompted him to go to meetings at the local chapter of the Descendants of Confederate Veterans. He began identifying more and more with his ancestors, and through Civil War reenactments, he began to see the war differently, not as a struggle to liberate the slaves by a benign North, as he had always been taught, but instead as a struggle for Southern freedom in the face of blatant Northern aggression. As he looked at the world he lived in, he couldn't help but recognize the forces that drove modern U.S. ambitions in the world as the same ones that feel the Civil War. Not benevolence, but a benevolent hunger for power. His newfound Southern identity was causing a friction in other areas of his life. He still went to meetings at the Socialist Student Union at Towson, but he fretted they were getting caught up with small issues and not focusing on anti-imperialism. Gay rights and feminism were all well and good. Matthew was still an atheist at the time, and the culture wars didn't really interest him except for the abortion issue, on which he was vehemently on the side of the right for life. But what good is social justice like a fundamentally unjust world when the United States trampled around like a bull in a china shop? He had also been reading how immigration was really no more a tool developed by capitalists to further their own agenda. So it frustrated him when his socialist friends took up causes like immigration reform and it seemed so clear that immigration and socialism were mutually exclusive as he saw it. Immigrants from developing countries provided cheap labor for fat cat capitalists, and he was fabricated that his fellow socialists couldn't see that. He was also becoming increasingly frustrated with the petty and meaningless squabbles within the group, and made it all but impossible to get anything done. There were Trotskyists who were endlessly preoccupied with the Spanish Civil War, Leninists who went on need about a Bolshevik revolution in the United States, and how the Trotskyists fundamentally got the role of the proletariat wrong. Marxists who felt like the Leninists had perverted Marx's vision of Marxist Bolshevism, and finally the Maoists who said they were all wrong and that the revolution needed to come from the rural districts of America and not the urban workforce. Matthew didn't know how to fight U.S. imperialism, but he felt if there was going to be any chance of success, he would need to reach regular working people not sitting around a campus discussing the finer points of General Francisco Franco's fascist regime. During a visit to the library, Matthew picked up a copy of a book that would solidify his political shift. Death of the West, published in 2001, was Pat Buchanan's polemical triad about how everything from socialism to immigration was ensuring the death of the white race. Buchanan was a former power player inside the Republican Party advising both Presidents Nixon and Reagan, but when he failed to secure the GOP presidential nomination in two primaries, 1992 and 1996, Buchanan veered to the right, leaving the Republican Party and warned in 1999 and warning 
This year, I believe, is her last chance to save our republic before she disappears into the godless new world order that our elites are construction in the betrayal of everything which our founding fathers fought, lived, and died for. Rallying against both Democrats and Republicans as unable, unwilling to drain this political swamp was the debut of what became a mantra in a successful pre- presidential campaign 16 years later. Buchanan went to def- on to defeat his biggest rival in the Reform parties and the person who would eventually go to, to use much of his rhetoric to win the presidency, Donald J. Trump. Although his campaign after the primaries went nowhere, his rhetoric and ideas not only inspired a generation of far-right activists, but gave rise to a new American nationalism. Paleoconservatism has deep roots in American society, with much of its ideological detritus going back to the old right, the conservative movement that fought hard against Roosevelt's New Deal, and the widely isolationist and anti-Semitic John Birch Society. The John Birch Society, named after an American missionary killed in China, whom its founder, Robert W. Welch Jr., believed to be the first casualty of the Cold War, was fiercely anti-communist, proponent of very limited government. Founded in 1958, a man so eminently paranoid, he once accused President Eisenhower of being a dedicated, uh, conscious agent of the communist conspiracy and alleged that the U.S. government was under operational control of the communist party. The JBS institutionalized the virulence, xenophobia, and isolationist tendencies that would later propel Pat Buchanan to fame and Donald Trump into the White House. Although JBS is remarkably primarily for its members in intermediate fear of anything that smacked of communism, it reserved its ear for the fight against civil and equal rights in America. Ha- even this, however, was couched into an obstinical fight against the Soviet menace. In an editorial in the Palm Beach Post from October 31st, 1965, a JBS representative explained that while society had nothing against civil rights per se, the civil rights movement was founded by communist agitators acting on behalf of the Soviet regime. Much like future paleocons and nationals would discuss both feminist and social justice movements as false flag operations instigated by the insidious skullduggery of global Zionism. Indeed, JBS took an early stance against the so-called New World Order, a perceived global socialist world government led by liberal financiers and a common code word for Jews. To this day, remaining JBS dangers warrant of the United Nations is the first step to complete loss of U.S. sovereignty. The rise of Barry Goldwater, no stranger to race baiting himself, coupled with the ascendancy of the brand of conservatism espoused by the National Review, temporarily broke the back of the John Birch Society and by extension paleoconservatism in America. By that time, many of society's most Ardent zealots had moved on, building a radical, at times violent, strain of white nationalism upon the foundation of America First xenophobia. For example, after leaving the JBS, Robert Matthews became one of America's most notorious far right terrorists, performing a streak of violent robberies and trying to provoke revolution in 1984, killing the Jewish radio host Alan Berg. Gordon Cowell was also a member of the society before he, his foray into the anti-government world of Pose Comiatus ended with the death of two federal agents as well as the firefight in 1983 took Cowell's own life. The same forces that had vanquished the JBS almost three decades ago earlier feel the rise of Pat Buchanan's brand of paleoconservatism. Rear the neocons interventionism, but rising immigration, the Republican base was ready to accept a more isolationist version of conservative politics, and Buchanan had been a vocal critic of the first Iraq war and the furious opposition to the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, it was able to capitalize despite racism and anti-Semitism running through his politics. 
Matthew found himself enthralled by the urgency of Buchanan's message. He not only shared Matthew's sense of moral decay, but also railed against U.S. leaders' policies in a way Matthew had never heard before. In the death of the West, Buchanan argued that socialism, liberal values, and expansive government had led America down a road to ruin which there was almost no escape without major upheaval. And then in his book, A Republic, Not an Empire, Buchanan scolded American policymakers for their jingoistic ways, arguing that the United States had no place for meddling in other nations' affairs. According to Buchanan, the baby boomers, complacent from childhood, in front of the TV with no great war to forge them like their parents had, were just decadent. They were entitled to men equal rights, not just for African Americans, but also, in Buchanan's view, perhaps more shockingly, women. Weaving an intricate way with the cause and effect, Buchanan claimed that the women's rights not only led to promiscuity, moral collapse, but they eventually the demise of the white race. According to him, doing one's thing had subverted the perpetuation of the white race. Although Matthew wasn't particularly concerned about promiscuity and declining morals, he concerned about universe imperialism. In Buchanan, he found a kindred spirit, and more importantly, a guide to the world of right-wing politics. He left the socialist group at Towson behind, instead of focusing on organizing at his own high school. In 2008, the first black student union was formed at Bloomsville High School, and Matthew decided to form a white student union right student union in response. In his mind, the white students, out of sense of fairness, if the African-American kids got their own union, and so should the white kids. Fair is fair, political correctness be damned. Besides, Poosville was overwhelmingly white, and all the black kids sat together in the cafeteria anyway, so if the races were segregating themselves naturally, then it followed that the white students should all have the same things that the black students had. The school didn't see it that way. Matthew had gathered a prerequisite number of signatures, Reformers Union, but the school's principal, Dina Laven, still refused permission, saying the very notion of a union for white students was offensive. Matthew was furious. The school leadership, he determined, was made up of weak cowards. Of course, he realized that a white student union would offend some people, but wasn't that the point of fairness? Nobody deserves special treatment, and, it pissed, and if it pissed some people off, that was just too bad. During his year, Senior year, Matthew's parents split up and his dad moved in with a new girlfriend, pretty much severing all ties with Matthew, his brother, sister, and mom. A devout Catholic, Margaret never agreed to the divorce, even keeping her ex-husband's last name, despite the ignoble nature of the breakup. Matthew was crushed. He'd been close with his dad and looked up with him, and now his dad was out of his life. It would be years until they spoke again. Matthew was 17 and becoming increasingly ardent in his views. He lived in a good school district and hated the sight of kids from poorer neighborhoods being bussed in. He resented the rich D.C. families in his town and assumed they resented him too. Once, during a school debate on immigration, he called his Hispanic opponent a wetback and told him to get the hell out of his country. He recognized Buchanan's writings in the world around him. If race wasn't really important, then why did the black kids hang out with the black kids, the white kids with white people, and Hispanic people with Hispanic people? Also, why could the black kids talk about about black power? One time he wore a t-shirt with a confederate flag. A black kid called him a racist and smacked him on the back of his head. By fall of 2009, when he enrolled in Montgomery College, a neighboring town 30 minutes away, Matthew was an availed paleocon. He started making his way back into Catholicism, realizing that although faith wasn't the key to who he was as a person, Christianity nevertheless formed the foundation of the white race. His politics hardened into a worldview which the white race represented the pinnacle of the human endeavor, and he believed that most, if not all, major human achievements in the last centuries could be attributed to whites. Eventually, he believed there would be a class of civilizations. There was no getting along with their cultures and religions because the future was a zero-sum game, so the white race either prevailed or vanished. That's why he started coming to school with a t-shirt that said, Everything I need to know about Islam, I learned on 9-11. He majored in history and was vocal in class. He liked to provoke, and according to his teachers, he wasn't very popular with other students in the class. Save for a couple of friends who hung on his every word. Sitting behind a laptop that had a sticker that said, If I had knew the trouble they caused, I would have picked the cotton myself. 
He would lob racist and incendiary comments no matter the, what the topic was discussing. Once during a lecture on lynchings in the South, he said that at least the lynchings saved the state at the expenses of a trial. One of his professors, Dr. Joseph C. Thompson, remembers him as a clever kid who liked to argue but whom he could never quite figure out. Matthew wasn't the first conservative kid to walk through the door. No, he was the first anti-government racist kid. Yet Matthew didn't fit any of the regular boxes. Sure, he was far right and conservative, but he was fiercely pro-workers and unions. Also for an arch-conservative, he had little interest in the culture wars beyond abortion that normally animated conservatives. What drove him to seem to be a profound worry for the future of the white race? Once Dr. Ch- Thompson told him that demographers estimate that sometime between 2040 and 2050, Caucasians will no longer be the majority in the United States. And asked Matthew, what's he do for that? That terrifies me, Matthew said. That does not scare you. Matthew would often spend hours in Dr. Thompson's office arguing with his liberal professor. He was always polite during our discussions, Dr. Thompson recalled, and it was never ugly. Most of the time, they discussed race or history. And Dr. Thompson sometimes got the feeling that Matthew was using their meetings to hone his arguments, often coming in and flourishing about one thing or another, then becoming quiet when his professor gave him a rebuttal. Other times, he wondered if Matthew was perhaps using their meetings to talk him off the ledge. Dr. Thompson suspected that Matthew's politics were taking him in a direction that he necessarily didn't want to go in. He noticed that Matthew's clique of fellow conservatives began peeling off as Matthew's viewpoints become increasingly outrageous, and he would wonder, perhaps... Matthew was looking for someone to tell him that he was wrong empathetically enough to make him change course. Another one of Matthew's teachers, Dr. Kurt Borkman, was one of the only conservative professors at Montgomery College and a devout Lutheran. Remembers Matthew as an intellectual arsonist, seemingly more interested in provoking than convincing others. Both Thompson and Borkman regarded Matthew as smart and clever, but neither was sure he was intelligent. Dr. Thompson said he was smart because he could recite facts, but perhaps not intelligent because he never seemed to give facts his own interpretation. Dr. Borkman saw him as someone who was clever, clearly clever, but wondered how he wasn't intelligent enough to see through the blatant pseudoscience behind paleoconservative arguments. As with Dr. Thompson, Matthew would spend hours in Dr. Borkman's office discussing history and, like his colleague, Dr. Portman would try to steer the young ideologue away from his increasingly racist and hardlined views. In particular, he felt that Matthew could be guided away from the path he was on and try to, to push against Matthew's most bombastic arguments. But despite the best efforts of the teachers Matthew looked up to, it wasn't enough, and Matthew continued to move steadily further right. In his sophomore year, Matthew discovered Youth for Western Civilization, YWC, a national organization in which local chapters that perfectly summed up the politics of time. Not only were they against immigration and multiculturalism, but they also saw odious forces working to undermine Western society by advancing both. Formed in 2005 by act- student activist Kevin Deanna, YWC thought to defend Western culture from the perceived threats of immigration and liberalism. Though the organization claimed it wasn't racist, its fetishization of Western, i.e. white, culture was close associated with many races placed it far to the right of other paleocons. In many ways, YWC, which boasted a few hundred members when Matthew discovered it, was a precursor to what would become the alt-right movement. Matthew met Deanna in 2010 at CPAC, an annual convention for conservatives outside Washington, D.C., and it was immediately inspired. YWC was expanding, adding chapters at universities all over the country. And Matthew wanted to set one up at Montgomery, but couldn't get the faculty sponsorship required to start an official group. Matthew would have better luck when he transferred from Montgomery College to the larger Towson University at the start of his junior year. There he threw himself into YWC. He eventually managed to recruit a professor to serve as their faculty advisor and soon the head of the brand new Towson branch of YWC. Politically, YWC was so far to the right of the extreme Republicans, but they shared almost no ground with the thuggish skinheads 
the Nazis on the outer fringes. For one, there was support of Israel, and rather than stern pe- speeches, their activities, although festive to most, certainly racist, were tongue in cheek, and once their goal was much provocation, was political advocacy. Once they held the straight pride parade in mockery of the gay civil rights movement, another time they hosted an affirmative action bake sale where they sold cupcakes to students at various prices, depending on who the buyer was. White males, $2, Hispanics, one fifty, African Americans, one dollar and Jews seventy five cents. The student body was outraged. Various student groups organized the protest, including Jewish students at Montgomery who weren't buying the YWC stated support of Israel. Matthew had been pondering the so called JQ, the Jewish question, for some time. The Jewish question has for centuries been used as a handy tool to disguise blatant racism and obscenely anthropologic anthropologic curiosity. The question through its literation boils down whether the Jews should be considered white and what is their place in a white led society should be. Matthew was now beginning to believe that they were not white, but they were also not friendly to whites like him. He had been re- reading revisionist history about World War II and the Holocaust, and to him it seemed like to prove that the murder of 6.6 million Jews was not only likely an exaggeration, but probably a fabrication at the large part benefit to its exposed supposed victims. A popular number thrown around in revisionist circles is roughly tenth of the number historians agree upon. The higher number of 6.6 million according to some Holocaust deniers not only wildly inflated but also a tool used by Jews ever since in order to guilt the world and giving them what they want. Matthew had now moved on from the canon and was testing the more frigid waters of the far right writers such as David Duke. Duke, a former Grand Wizard in the Ku Klux Klan, and one term representative in the Louisiana House of Representatives, twice failed presidential campaign demagogue, talk show host, and strident Holocaust denier, pinned Jews not only of the woes of the world, but also many of the societal advances he felt low arch conservative races also loathed. According to Duke, both abortion rights and the feminist movement were the schemes hatched by Jews to decimate Gentile populations of the world. Not only, Duke claims that Jews were behind communism and extension of the gulag, once again in a brazen attempt at undermining white European culture. Matthew embraced Duke's ideas. For a long time, he had felt that Jewish groups on campus vilified him, even though he had ostensibly supported Israel. In his mind, he had never... He never had a problem with Jews, but they seemed to have a problem with him, attacking him at rallies, calling him a Nazi, and threatening him and his family. Once the YWC were attacked for protesting the University Muslim Society over their invitation to a speaker whom Matthew and his friends saw as a radical Islamic, Matthew believed that the ringleaders behind this attack were Jewish and that he struggled to understand why Jewish students would have a problem with the YWC protesting radical Islam. Why should Matthew go out of his way to support a people who clearly hated him? As a child, he had been taught the Jews were God's chosen people and that he had to be on their side, but the books he was reading proved that God's chosen people were the enemies of his race. Being the leader of the Towson chapter of YWC was Matthew's entrance in the political arena and the leader of a group known as the Campus Nazis. It was a ban- baptism of fire. Other students hurled abuse at him in the quad and he was deeply unpopular in class. Expect for his regular posse of hanger-ons who had followed him from Montgomery, he didn't have many friends at school. The few friends he did have outside YWC were dissing themselves from him. One of his friends in YWC suffered a nervous breakdown and left school. Matthew was threatened and his family received phone abuse. His mother begged him to stop, but despite being ostracized and ridiculed, he kept at it, convincing himself that his work was far more important than his own comfort. He started to go to church again, at first on Sundays and then every day. He read old religious texts and soon reached the conclusion that the weakness and fecklessness that had made him despise the church was a result of modernity. The church wasn't weak, only the people who had been running it for the last 500 years ever since the East-West Schism that divided the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Orthodoxy felt right to Matthew. It was strong and often merciless. It was masculine for men and feminine for women, celebrating the differences of the genders rather than claiming that the genders were equal. Every day he kneeled 
by the statue of his favorite saint, St. Michael, the archangel, who in the Orthodox faith is invoked for protection against invasion from the enemies. As he prayed, Matthew looked up at the statue of the great archangel holding a flaming sword and imagined himself a protector of his race and people. After being condemned by the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, a non-profit based in Alabama that specializes in monitoring far-right activity in America, the faculty sponsor withdrew his support and YWN at Towson folded. Once again, Matthew was outraged by what he saw as refusal to support basic fairness. He couldn't for the life of him understand the furious and sometimes violent reactions the YWC. Every kind of minority got to organize, but as soon as white students were organized in a way that signaled pride in their race, everyone was suddenly all up in arms about Nazis on campus. The fact that Towson University was more than two-thirds white and that the student unions had been formed for groups who found themselves in minority was not something Matthew considered. Throughout its brief existence, YWC had been called the White Student Unions by its critics, and so Matthew decided that it was what people decided they were, and what they would be was that the White Student Union was born. The organization, which had 17 members at the time it was founded, was meant to be a safe place that Matthew had come to believe was from deliberate anti-white discrimination at Towson. Somewhere over the course at this time in YWC, Matthew had decided that Towson was becoming increasingly hostile to whites, particularly white women, who he believed were targets of racially based slurs and sexual sexualized violence. Matthew pr- believed that, like St. Michael, his job was to protect his kin from the predatory nature of other races. Having washed his hands completely of YWC, Towson University wanted nothing to do with Matthew's new group, but that didn't stop him from staging protests on campus and arranging nighttime patrols in search of crime. Despite, despite a complete lack of evidence, Matthew believed that the school was in the middle of a dramatic crime wave where even the white students were often its victims, so he and his friends armed themselves with a magnite flashlight pepper spray, stalking the campus ground looking for evildoers. Although no delinquents were ever foiled, Matthew did find plenty of national attention, landing him on Nukes Cast in almost overnight, announcing him as the new face of racism in America. The journalists and pundits liked him because he was rigorous and affable and was always willing to talk to them while at the same time putting a new spin on old cliches about racial separation. It was the WSU that Matthew first debuted in his signature Live and Let Live form of racism, describing later in a documentary produced by Vice now that he believed that especially the black communities will find areas in the south, areas of Detroit, where they can have their own homelands, we don't have to be antagonistic towards them. If you want to sell yourself and your children down the river of multiculturalism, you can do that. But we deserve the right to exist, deserve the right to defend our culture, and deserve the right to have a future for our culture. The attention amused Matthew, but his family had had enough. Matthew had been regularly making the news, and it was causing friction between his mother and siblings. During Easter in 2012, Matthew's senior year at Towson University, at a family gathering, he got into an argument with his aunt about the Trayvon Martin shooting, in which he firmly defended the shooter, George Zimmerman. After that, Matthew's aunt made it clear that she no longer wanted to be in the same room as Matthew, and as a result, he was asked to stay away at Thanksgiving. Matthew's grandfather died the day after. Although his mom asked him not to come to the funeral, Matthew, who had loved his grandfather dearly, still showed up, sitting awkwardly with his family, who didn't want him to be there. He left after the funeral without saying goodbye, and it would be the last time he saw his family. He returned to Towson and threw himself in his new venture, the WSU. He would take what he had learned about organizing during his time with the YWS and use it to expand his to group his colleges across America, and from there he would build a movement. Okay.